Special shout out to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this episode. Keep your entire digital life secure on all your devices with just one account with Surfshark VPN. Electric vehicles have been around for over a hundred years. In fact, some of the first cars were electric, but the low cost, wide proliferation, and big money interest have led to a century of internal combustion engine dominance. But by the late 1980s, environmental concerns caused consumers, politicians, and even manufacturers to rethink our reliance on fossil fuels and the internal combustion engine. California was suffocating under a thick, dark blanket of smog, prompting politicians to pressure the auto industry into making substantial changes. Enter the General Motors EV1, the world's first mass-produced all-electric vehicle. Among its drivers, the EV1 held an unprecedented cult status. But by the end of the 90s, GM would completely scrap the program and demolish every single EV1 on the road deeming the endeavor an utter commercial failure. How did the car that launched an environmental revolution meet such a catastrophic demise? And what mark, if any, did the EV1 leave on the automobile industry? Like all great car stories, the epic of the EV1 begins with a race. The 1987 World Solar Race where major auto manufacturers, engineers, and dreamers raced around the Australian outback in space-age machines fueled by the power of the sun. General Motors emerged victorious with their entry, the Sun Racer, a vehicle better suited for Marvin the Martian than George Meharis. The Sun Racer's victory prompted GM CEO Roger Smith to consider retooling the competition vehicle's electric components into a street-ready consumer car. Within three years, GM unveiled the Impact, a fully electric concept car at the 1990 LA Auto Show. The Impact lived up to its name, generating buzz with media outlets, automakers, and environmentalists, leading Smith to announce that GM would begin mass production, though at the time it was still unclear whether such a feat would even be possible. By 1996, the EV1 emerged. 26 lead-acid batteries provided the sleek, subcompact coupe with over 130 brake horsepower. Aeronautical engineer Paul McCready designed the car's exterior which had the lowest drag coefficient of any production vehicle at the time. GM even claimed that the drag of the EV1 was the same as a jet fighter. Wings down, of course. Additional on-demand torque provided by the electric motor catapulted the EV1 from 0 to 60 in 8 seconds. Ungoverned EV1s could reportedly reach a top speed of over 180 miles per hour. To match the fighter jet exterior, the EV1 came with a space age inspired interior. Instead of analog gauges, a thin black visor across the dash displayed digital readouts. Instead of a traditional ignition lock, a smooth black keypad for keyless entry and ignition. The design pulled drivers out of the stone age and into a sleek, sexy, and clean future. Now, before we get back to the story, I want to take a quick minute and say thank you to our sponsor, Surfshark VPN. If you've ever used public Wi-Fi at a coffee shop or an airport, your data is not very secure, and using a VPN service can encrypt your data and ensure that nobody can see what you're doing. And with an exit node in some other location, people can't even tell where you're coming from. This is interesting for a couple of reasons. For one, if you're doing any kind of shopping online, Using a different location, for example, when you buy airplane tickets, can actually give you cheaper prices based on where they think you're coming from. Where you're coming from might determine what kind of TV shows you're able to watch on streaming services like Netflix. So take your online security to the next level and go to surfshark.deal slash DaVinci. Enter checkout code DaVinci for 85% off and an extra three months for free. Innovative though it was, the EV1 with its higher production cost and razor thin profit margins was a tremendous risk for GM, who considered the endeavor more a marketing experiment than anything else. All EV1s were available for lease only, with the option to purchase excluded by the contractual clause. Pressure from the California Air Resources Board, or CARB, only added fuel to the embers of GM's concerns. 
The zero emission impact prompted CARB to place a mandate on all car companies to slowly introduce zero emission vehicles over the next 10 years. For GM, still unsure if electric vehicles could truly be mass produced and sold to the public, this mandate turned a hopeful venture into a death sentence. Reluctantly, GM rolled forward with the EV1 program. Upon release, the EV1 was a smash hit among devout environmentalists, celebrities like Tom Hanks and Mel Gibson, executives, and politicians eager to bolster their anti-pollution policies. But with a leasing price ranging between three to $600 per month, the EV1 never really stood a chance of becoming anything more than a sporty plaything for the financially elite. For the everyday commuter, the car presented some very real concerns. GM gave the EV1 a stated range of about 90 miles per charge. In reality, drivers typically got around 40 to 50 miles after battery draining factors like the stop and go of city traffic, air conditioning, and acceleration boost on the interstate. For many drivers, a limited range combined with the long recharge time deflated a bit of their excitement for the car overall. Still, for the most part, EV1 lessees expressed only their devout fondness for the car, as well as for its potential to bring zero emission vehicles into the mainstream. My interest in the EV1 was primarily to help the environment, and then I drove the car, and the environment factor went out the window. It's such a great car to drive. Of course, no forward step in innovation happens without sizable pushback. While lessees embraced the EV1 with unbridled enthusiasm, opposition quickly emerged. Upon the EV1's release, several consumer groups crawled out of the woodworks to protest various concerns about the EV1 and the tax breaks that lessees received. However, many of these so-called consumer groups turned out to be puppets funded by oil companies interested in guarding their own interests. Perhaps the most damaging resistance to the EV1 was not some outside force. Minimal advertising, spotty market research, and expensive production methods indicated to EV1 enthusiasts that GM opposed the car's success from within. As GM maintained that there was no consumer demand for electric vehicles, many EV1 sales specialists reported calls from tens of thousands of eager consumers hoping to lease an EV1. Still, GM seemed to ignore these numbers as well as the genuine concerns voiced by hopeful drivers about the car's performance. No one knows exactly why GM seemed to oppose its own breakthrough product. Some speculated that GM feared a successful electric car might kill their investment in the internal combustion engine and all the repair parts and costs associated with it. Regardless of the reason, GM seemed determined to see the EV1 fail. Critics further contended that the CARB legislation stoked GM's fears of more unwanted regulation from other states. GM, in collaboration with other major auto manufacturers, even went as far as to sue CARB in federal court, prompting CARB to loosen and ultimately eliminate the stipulations. After federal mandates fell, GM, now led by CEO Rick Wagoner, ultimately decided to cease production on all EV1s, officially shutting down the assembly line in 1999. And we are not going to just stand here. We're going to keep demanding that they build these cars again. Anybody and ultimately, the leasing program three years later. By November 2003, to the dismay of lessees, the company began repossessing every EV1 on the road. Drivers even attempted to purchase their vehicles from GM to no avail. The repossessions of the EV1 even prompted a car funeral, which gained national media attention. It is difficult to know what to say at a time like this. To be honest with you, I consulted my rabbi's manual and there was absolutely nothing in it for the burial of a car. <laughs> this is even more sad because on the same day, 10 solar powered electric cars arrived in Claremont with lithium batteries on board. Lithium batteries that could take an EV 350 miles on a charge instead of 100 miles. But all R&D stopped on electric cars about five years ago when our politicians and the manufacturers who convinced them of this decided they no longer required the state of California to have electric cars. And so... To add insult to injury, GM not only reclaimed, but proceeded to demolish these cars. 
Of the 1,100 EV1s produced, about 40 deactivated vehicles went to museums and educational institutions under the agreement that the cars were not to be reactivated. The fate of the EV1 remains a tragic footnote among innovators, consumers, and environmentalists. From GM's perspective, the vehicle was a total commercial failure. For drivers and environmentalists, the EV1 represents the often detrimental influence of corporate entities on true innovation. However, from a technological standpoint, the EV1 is nothing short of a true milestone. Following bankruptcy and massive government bailouts, former GM CEO Wagoner has since said that killing the EV1 was his worst decision. While General Motors' legacy is still in recovery, the EV1 remains an icon of innovation. In 2017, Elon Musk claimed that he founded Tesla in response to GM's killing the EV1 program. Tesla is currently way more valuable than Ford or GM. In fact, the success of Tesla has even prompted GM to hop back in the electric car arena with the Chevy Bolt. Still, it's hard not to look back at the EV1 and wonder what could have been. What might our roads, our homes, and the planet look like had the zero emission car been given genuine support a full decade sooner? We will never know the answers to these questions, but we can thank the EV1 for being the brave first step. As Paul McCready stated in his speech at the EV1 funeral, it's a time for rejoicing. There will be more electric vehicles in the future, and it's all because of the EV1. So that is the story of the EV1. And if you haven't seen the documentary, Who Killed the Electric Car, definitely check it out. It really gets into the politics and all that went into the decision to eventually crumple these cars and keep them off the roads. As sad as those leases must have been back in the day, we now have Tesla who garners so much publicity in the news. And the electric car has kind of become the big hot new thing. So try as they might, it seems we have entered an era now where even the big oil companies can't really stop true innovation. I do wanna add one more thing about the EV1 though. There are people who said that if GM just built the EV1 that it would have been game over and they'd have sold millions of them. But I think there has been asterisk along with that because the EV1 used lead acid batteries and lead acid batteries don't have the best energy density. It wouldn't have really been that easy or possible to scale up the EV1 to get maybe 200 miles of range. Plus the degradation levels were so high that I don't know if GM could have actually honored any kind of a warranty on the battery. I'm not sure if the EV1 would have reached 100,000 miles on the lead acid battery without major degradation. And when you only start with about 80 miles of range, the degradation levels, if they're big enough, can mean the car is really not even usable to drive one way to where you're going. So there was a lot of challenges. Plus the fact that in North America, at least, people were falling in love with the SUV. In the early 2000s, that was the rise of the SUV. And the entire car buying segment had shifted from sedans to SUVs. And the EV1, tiny as it was, probably wouldn't have appealed to everyone. But the fact remains, there was no reason why GM shouldn't have built as many as they could and had sold as many as they could. Um, and that is the true tragedy of this story. But thank you guys so much for watching. Um, let us know what you think. If you've seen the video, you know the story, or you've heard some of the conspiracy theories, leave them in the comments as always. We love hearing from you guys. Um, if you're new, consider subscribing. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you want to be a rock star supporter of the show, consider joining us on Patreon. I'm Ricky with Tiba Da Vinci. Thank you so much for watching.